it live streaming as well. So there are a bunch of people in Swansea right now who are watching, ready for the fireside chat too. So hello everybody in Swansea. Uh, to do make sure you're also submitting your questions as well. And hopefully we have a really good event. So without further ado, uh, we are going to introduce you to Elizabeth Farley, founder of Tech Hub and Dame Stephanie Shirley. Mary had a little lamb. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, welcome. Uh, it's uh, incredibly exciting to have this inspiring woman here uh, with us today. It's not me. <laughs> so hang this over here. Um, I think we're one. Maybe I'm a bit close to the. I'd like to say welcome to our very first large event in our brand new space, but I think that that is becoming vastly apparent by the moment. Uh, thank you for bearing with us uh, with some slight technical hitches. They are special effects. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, we'll, uh, we'll just let Purdy keep going with that and we will, uh, yeah, we, 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 we will crack on. So thank you very much for being here. I am Elizabeth Barley. I'm the uh, founder and CEO of Tech Hub. Uh, I'm sure you, uh, you, you've all had a great introduction uh, to what Tech Hub is. We have loads of people around the room from the Tech Hub team. Stick up your hands, Tech Hub team, uh, around the room. Uh, if you want to have a chat uh, about uh, Tech Hub membership, about the kinds of uh, events we run uh, like this. Uh, how many people in the room are Tech Hub members? Loads of Tech Hub members. So if you want to know more about what Tech Hub is really like, have a chat to them, uh, and I'm sure that they can tell you all about that. But uh, for now, uh, on with the show. Uh, first, I'd very much like to thank uh, our two partners for this evening. Uh, we have Hired and Silicon Valley Bank who have helped make this possible and who have given you all a lovely book that um, that Dame Stephanie will it be It is a very signing. lovely book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that she'll be uh, available to sign uh, afterwards, so make sure you grab a copy of that uh, over there. Uh, and so the only thing left to do is to welcome Dame Stephanie. Uh, or should we call you Steve today? Well, there's a long story about that, really. Do you want it now? <laughs> I'm going to do a quick introduction. Right. Let's, you do your let's go on with that. So Dame Stephanie Steve Shirley, a successful IT entrepreneur and turned ardent philanthropist. Uh, having arrived in Britain as an unaccompanied child refugee in 1939, she started a company which was called freelance programmers uh, that became Zanta PLC, which is now part of the Sotra Group. Uh, you started in your on your dining room table with six pounds in 1962. It was worth a bit more in those days. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she was 25 years uh, its chief executive. Uh, she developed it into a leading business technology group, uh, pioneering new work practices and changing the position uh, for professional women, especially in high tech along the way, as it was staffed entirely by women uh, in the early days. Uh, they produced all kinds of different uh, products and software, which we'll talk about uh, uh, a little bit later. But one of the uh, one of the things that has always uh, struck me is that you programmed the black box for the Concorde, mm -hmm. which is uh, which is pretty exciting. Um, uh, Dame Stephanie's dameship uh, in the Millennium Honours was for services to IT. Uh, she served on many corporate boards, including Tandem Computers and John Lewis Partnership. Um, her philanthropy is based on her strong belief in giving back to society and focuses around autism. Her charity, the Shirley Foundation, focuses on autism, making over, you've made over £67 million in grants mm -hmm. so far and initiated some really pioneering projects. She was ordered the, uh, sorry, awarded the Order of Companions of Honour in the Queen's Birthday Honours in 2017 and I could go on. Um, 
please. Nobody knows what a companion of honour is. <laughs> there are only 65 of us in the world. What, what does it mean exactly? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a nice honour. <laughs> what does it mean to you? I find as a refugee to be accepted by uh, the establishment is still important to me. And so something like that, where you go to Buckingham Palace and people are very nice to you and offer you champagne and stuff like that, I think it's terrific. And I'll work quite a long time to get that sort of recognition. Fantastic. Um, so perhaps we could we could chat a little bit um, first about uh, your about your background. Um, what what kickstarted um, your career, you've said uh, previously, is the decisions you made during your education where you studied maths. And to do that, you had to go to an all boys <laughs> school. Well, girls of my generation were not expected to study science. And the only science really thought respectable for girls was botany, the study of plants. Um, but um, I really, for some reason, I loved mathematics, I found it easy, and in a sense that's what, what happens. We're good at the things that uh, we enjoy, and we enjoy the things that we're good at. Um, and I had to change schools twice in order to get tuition in mathematics, and finished up at a boys' school, which was a wonderful forerunner of the sort of sexism in the workplace when I eventually got there. <laughs> what, what was it? Did you do things differently being in that sort of all-male environment? Well, I was very shy and I sort of crept around and the boys were sort of catcalling and whistling and so on. It was pretty horrible. But once I got actually into the uh, lecture hall, I did love it and I was better than most of them. <laughs> and did they know that you were better than most yes, of them? Yes, they That can't be <laughs> wrong at all. And was that, did that inform... Uh, anything about why you decided to start the business and why you decided to start with women? Not really, but in, in those days you did actually need mathematics to work on the early computers. Um, and so there was a whole wave of, of maths graduates. Um, in, if you go to the National Museum of Computing, you'll sort of see how, how close it was there. But what really initiated my first um, entrepreneurial exercise and the biggest one, really, was sexism. I had got so fed up of working in the world where uh, I was ignored, where uh, people were patronising to me, um, where people did not expect uh, me to perform in the same, they didn't measure what I was doing by the, in the same way as they did the men. And eventually I just got fed up with it and said, I'm going to set up my own company uh, to do this, what I enjoy doing and what I have been doing as an employee. Um, and it's going to be a company that's suitable for me and for any other women that want to work like me. Um, and so the motivation was not financial. It was 25 years before we paid a dividend. Um, but it was very much a social business measured by uh, the employment opportunities that we were giving to women who at that time were pretty blocked. Mm. And uh, how did you go about finding the right kind of people for, for that? It must have been really difficult. Well, you see, you never know what, what life throws at you. In fact, it was very easy to find software people because women were um, not in, welcome in the workforce. Um, a tiny little mansion in the Manchester Guardian that there was this weird woman, Steve Shirley, working in Chesham uh, on computer software, brought in a flood of national, of, from across the nation, of women who wanted to work from home on software. And I never really had to recruit again. It, the, the occasional advertisement that went in where I would sort of say, you can't, even then I didn't say women only, uh, but I did say not suitable for anti-feminists. <laughs> <laughs> did, did you get many men applying, given that? Of the first 300 staff, 297 were women, so it was very, very slanted. 
uh, which was interesting that our legislative sex discrimination act came in. Um, but um, the first men were rather special, really. Um, some of them came in for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> but we also had some extremely good ones who were sensitive, who wanted to work in teams, things that stereotypically we think of as a feminine way of working. And that is much more by uh, measuring work done rather than the time spent. Um, the, the management environment in those days was very much command and control. Uh, if you do this, you'll get promoted. If you do that, you'll get fired. And, and, and that motivated people. Whereas women tend to be much more visionary. This is what we want to do. I'm going this way. Do you want to come and send me? Let, let's do it together. And that whole style uh, was very alien 50 years ago. And I am talking about 1962, I started my company. So a lot of things were very different. What was your question? <laughs> Oh, it was it difficult? And you've answered that. No, that's, okay. that's fine. We, we had a little chat before this, and we both said, we may forget what the questions are, but we'll just have to wing it if that happens. And so you've, uh, you've referred to yourself then uh, in that as Steve. And so perhaps uh, this is a good opportunity. This is, this is I think, my absolute favourite bit of your story. Um, to, to tell everyone why you're also known as Steve. Well, people laughed at me because at that time software was given away free with the hardware. Um, you can't have a software house. They laughed even louder at my sort of feminine slant to business. And when I, how do I get new business? Okay, my ex-employer was the first contract, but after that, how do I? And what I decided was to write letters to people who were advertising for programmers <laughs> and sort of say, well, I, I'm not applying for a programming job, but I can do programming for you. And I was launching these out before the days of word processing, um, by the dozen, really. And uh, it's absolutely no reply. And my dear husband suggested that I use the family nickname of Steve. So instead of writing that double feminine Stephanie Shirley, I wrote Steve Shirley. And the same letters to the same people began to get a response. And I got the odd meeting, and from those meetings I got a bit of work, and that was really the beginning. And so you were Steve. I've been Steve ever, ever since. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would love to talk about our product stuff because most of the people uh, here today are product entrepreneurs or members of, uh, of startup teams working uh, on, on different products. And so uh, it would be great to know what your initial process was from starting the idea of this company and then going through to creating actual products. Was it entirely bespoke for your clients or did you start to create a product that then was tweaked for different... It was entirely bespoke for clients, mm -hmm. which it gave a different slant to it. I mean, the market was very much commercial, things like... Um, payroll and stuff that people wanted doing. But I'm a scientist, um, and I wanted to do scientific work, and there wasn't a market there. Um, so I hit a compromise with operational research work. And so we did lots of scientific stock control was just coming in at that time. We did things like um, scheduling freight trains for British Rail. Um, stock control was for everything from enormous great big cables to tiny little pots of ice cream which melted. Um, so really it was bespoke to each customer, um, very bespoke actually. We'd occasionally salvage bits of previous work and re reuse it and cannibalize it. Um, but it was, a base, it was a much simpler world then. And we would think of, <coughs> invariably we worked in teams, the minimum size team was uh, one software specialist, one project manager, not full time in business. Um, in fact, most of the teams were 12, 30 people, the Concord project was about 30 strong and lasted I think nine months, something like that. So there were major contracts. And we had a wonderful time. We actually enjoyed it. And that's how a business should be. And, and we're talking here, so when we're, when we're talking about programming, we're not talking about programming 
in the way that everybody here programs. Uh, what exactly were your, your tools for the programming? Well, we started off writing with pencil and paper, uh, flow charts, basically defining the task to be done. And that was then uh, converted into code, usually machine code, but sometimes it was binary code, uh, which was shipped off by snail mail to a computer center where they didn't do computers, but they had the data preparation and it would be punched onto cards and paper tape and then it would be repunched in order to verify all that prior to submission to the mainframe computer. And our schedules were based on two accesses to the computer a week. So it was a very different way of working. But all the interest, all the fun of, of, of software was still there. It was just that much slower. So if uh, in the second time that week something didn't work, that was, that was sort of it. You had to wait until the yeah. following week to, to find out if the, if the fix worked. Well, we sometimes turned up to see if we could fix it right in, there and then. Um, experienced programmers could tell what the machine was doing by the sounds that it made. So, you know, it was very much sort of Doctor Who type stuff. I'm imagining people with stethoscopes, like, you know, listening to this, like, something's, something's up, there's a bug there somewhere. Um, and how did how did the Concord project come about? Was that uh, was that writing one of your letters, uh, or did it come through? A I think it came through our technical director Anne Leach, who is now Anne Moffat, and who was the um, president of the Australian Computing Society later. And I think she knew somebody who knew somebody. It was one of those networking things. Um, it was a uh, very prestigious uh, contract, obviously a very time sensitive and what it basically did was take the readings from some 40 or more um, analog uh, devices measuring acceleration height and angle of whatever it is um, and um, converting them into what's called a best protected black box um, and um, the boxes aren't incidentally black you know the only one i've ever seen was yellow um, but um, that was really um, a, a major task. The sensitivity of that, because this was pre-Concord, it wasn't announced yet. Um, we also had working on, for example, MasterCard. Uh, we were working on that for about a year before MasterCard was announced. Um, so you, you get in software access to all sorts of interesting things. You never know what you're going to be asked to do next week. And you operated on a fixed cost model? <laughs> How on earth was that possible? <laughs> I don't, don't understand. If you really have control over a, um, a method, um, then you should be able to plan it, measure it, monitor against time, time, time stops. Um, and we moved to fixed price, one of the very first to do so for software, to really disguise the ex essentially part-time nature of the workforce. We didn't want to stress that we were all female, we were working part-time, we were working remotely. Um, so by offering fixed prices, our tenders went out, this is the price, here are the details of the people who are going to work on the project, enough said. Did that cause you any problems? Going over budget, that sort of thing? Well, inevitably, yes. Um, we managed to build up a, a reputation for hitting timescales and um, costs simply by always adjusting timescales every time the customer changed their mind, and that's happening all, all the time. Um, it's, um, I mean, there was one year when we had a, a, a contract with the Sheffield Regional Hospital Board, and the, the numbers will seem silly to you because of inflation, um, but we bid £16,000 to do this piece of work. And there were lots of changes, and we didn't manage to do change management in those days, uh, and it cost us direct costs, 24000 mm -hmm. Now, we were a tiny little company. 
when you can't have a couple of contracts like that and you're dead. Um, so fixed price was risky and we tried to be very um, professional about measuring risk, um, assessing costs very carefully, reassessing as we got through a job um, and we managed to survive. Well done, that sounds incredibly <laughs> tricky, I don't know how you managed to do that. Um, that, that leads me on to how hard it can be to run a business, to start a business. I, I know that many of you uh, in the room today know what that's like, you know, the, the slog, the, the hours, the uncertainty, the having to keep going. How did you manage that sort of thing? I think the things I found difficult was not actually the technology or the methodology. It was the people problems of the company in that I very shortly found myself not writing software, which is what I love, um, but dealing with the cash flow and the insurance people and the, again, a lot of HR problems. You know, this one's in American problems, this one wants a baby and hasn't got one, this one's adopting, you know, absolutely. And I used to feel that the, 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 the whole of the company would be sitting on my shoulders, not healthy. Um, and that got very serious at one time because um, I did with family problems in parallel, which is why it's important to sort of know your staff and know who is in stress, who is stressed from things at home. Um, but basically, I broke down and uh, was no good to anybody. And so since then, I have learned that you have to have a certain sort of healthy selfishness to look after yourself, mind, body, and spirit, to make sure that that doesn't happen again. And I watched my, my team um, probably better because I have been seriously with mental health problems. You do recover. It was a year before I got back to work. And what happens to the business? Everything, all sorts of things happen while you're away. And you come back and it's a different business, but it's today's business. How did that uh, affect you coming back into that environment, having changed when you started it? I imagine it's like parents feel when a child goes into adolescence and starts getting a bit difficult and starts being <laughs> independent and so on. Um, it was strange to find that my little baby was now something different. Um, it hadn't gone the way that I thought a year ago. It had gone developed differently. People that I valued enormously had risen or left. People that I thought were really also around so they had performed beautifully. So a lot of surprises. And that's one of the things that's so, so, such fun about business. You are, each day is different. Um, you may, as the organisation becomes more corporate, be doing the same process, quarterly results, monthly results. You're doing the same thing, it's different. So be, to be called a managing director of a small company is so exciting, but it is also stressful. How did you, you, you started off working in the public sector and the private sector. How, what, what were the kind of challenges that you faced being a first time founder, aside from the finding clients, even though you were a woman and they didn't want to listen to you and that sort of thing. But sort of personally, were you, did you doubt yourself? Were you always really sure of what needed to happen? What was it like for you as an individual being a founder? Well, I certainly doubted, not my technical competence, um, but my management ability to, to cope with things. Um, but I'm a very proud person, and I was absolutely determined not to fail, that it wasn't just for me. It became a, a crusade for women generally. Um, I was, we had a recession in the 70s, where we nearly went out of business, and I was determined. Well, I was not going to be labelled as a sort of businesswoman who could run things when the market was good and couldn't cope when the market was was bad. Um, so I think it's my pride that kept me going. And as it developed over the years, and we finished up employing 8,500 people, but as it became more and more corporate, um, my pride took different roles. Um, I'm still 
nobody really knows where innovation comes from. Um, I know with me it, it has quite a long gestation period that somehow subconsciously I'm thinking about something for weeks or months and then say I think we'll do this. Um, and it's good to know for each individual where their innovation comes from because today that's what matters. It's not enough to be faster, cheaper, better. You really have to do new things if you're going to really thrive. What did you need to do personally? Was it about um, support outside the company, support inside the company that helped you to be able to, to stay in that position and stay innovative? I try to stimulate innovation, innovation in myself. Um, travel does it for me, being in a completely different environment. Um, working with other people of passion, whether they be poets or politicians, um, but not necessarily computer programmers. Um, it, I, I, I sort of learnt certain dodges of how do I get from here to here? And I'm trying to get your own idea how do I get from here to here? And then I say, well, how would it be to get from here to here? And sometimes that brings up a solution just by turning it upside down and, and looking at it in a different way. Um, the more tired you are, of course, the less innovative you are. Um, the less innovative you are, the more you think, I've got to, I've got to find a way, I've got to do this. But it's not easy. I really like that idea of how do I get from here to here, but looking the other direction. It I, works. I, yeah, I really like that one. Um, you worked across lots of different sectors. Um, was that difficult? Did you... Did you want to specialise in, in one area? I'm sure many people here who are doing enterprise uh, technology tend to focus on, you know, I'm, I'm focusing on, on selling into finance companies or I'm focusing on selling into uh, the public sector. Was that... I'm sure or that that is a good route to success, to really focus on a particular market sector, um, understand it, know what it needs to, to contribute to it. Um, it's not what I did. Um, I chased after anything that moved. Um, and it was the professional managers coming in after 20 years who actually sort of said, let's focus on the, the areas that are most profitable and they, they were the public sector, retail, and what was the third one? But I know it wasn't scientific. And of course, I was, I was a scientist, that's what I wanted to do, and I never really did much of it. Did you, uh, did you have to argue with, with the people, you know, people that came into the business, managers or the board? Well, argue is not a word, I think, that really applies in business. There should, in every business, be real discussion, be real listening to each other, because that's how we learn and that's how we get better solutions. Um, I work a lot with, with, with autism and um, I'm involved in getting people with autism into the workforce and they come up with, with such different views and attitudes. If you listen, there are good ways of doing things. Um, and I don't think in a company you can have disagreements, you can have disagreements that go on for a year, you're still discussing this, it's still going on, um, but eventually you will get to it. A happy solution, but probably a compromise. I'd like to talk uh, a bit about when uh, perhaps there's a not so happy solution. Uh, with uh, when starting businesses and growing businesses now, there's a big focus on being lean, iterating, <coughs> releasing products that you're embarrassed <coughs> about. That's how you know that you're you're getting it out there. And how how often did things go wrong? Are there things that that you would really have done differently? Did you kick yourself a lot? I know I've had that experience. I don't know if anybody else is resonating with that one. I think the things I did were pretty basic. Um, I got the <coughs> pricing wrong right from the beginning and it stayed wrong year after year, decade after decade. And it wasn't until the professional managers came in and said, you do what? You know, really, um, quite. Um, I really did not have financial skills and you do need you know, unnumerate 
but you need financial skills, I think, and, or learn them or get somebody in with them if you're going to run a business. Um, because it is um, not, a fun, not a fun thing, it's not an activity, um, it is business and has certain aims and rules and regulations. I found that because I hadn't been taught, I hadn't, didn't have good schooling, um, because nobody taught me what one wasn't supposed to do in business, I just went ahead and did it. And that's worth remembering. Um, if you want to do something in business, as long as it's legal, as long as you're not hurting somebody else, then just give it a try. Most products go out in prototype form. Um, they go to special clients who you know will critique them and, 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 and allow you to get um, a, a, a better product very quickly. So I don't think there's anything wrong with, with actually getting it out there, getting it out there. But you don't want to get a reputation that your product's not working. Mm -hmm. Did you ever have anything that went out there that that you then thought, oh, we, we really did this too early, or we really got something wrong? Because we were a service industry, the, the responsibility for what we were doing, I suppose, stayed with the client. Mm -hmm. So I'd say that didn't really happen for us in that way. So, as a leader, did you feel, did you select your board, personally? How did, uh, how did your board support you? I know that I talk to, to founders often who, who say, how do I, you know, I have one person I know I want on my board because they're someone I know and I think they're fantastic, but how do I build a board around me who can support me and not stifle me? Well, I think every entrepreneurial board starts like that. You, you approach somebody that you know, uh, maybe a friend and sort of say well I, I trust him will he come and help me at, at that level um, i think after that you become a little bit more um, focused and sort of say well i'm looking for somebody who understands marketing for heaven's sake or understands this <coughs> sector or understands how government works um, and try and get a balanced board um, i certainly that's how i approached all the directors. I headhunted for a chief executive once, uh, and very successful that was. But mainly, I approached people myself and got that done. Because you've got to trust them. You've got to like them. You're going to work in a stressful situation for the next few years. And there's no reason why we shouldn't all enjoy our colleagues' for company and, and skills. I'm going to uh, ask a, a couple more questions and then we're going to throw it open to the audience. We also have some questions coming through on Slido, I think, from our friends in Swansea and elsewhere. Um, I may need a device that has those on them, so I can have a look, or one of the team can uh, can, can shout those out. Um, alongside uh, your philanthropic work, you, you released your memoir, which has been re-released and, and we have here today. Um, Lots of lessons for entrepreneurs in that book. I hope on every page there's something that might help you. Well, it was described by the FT as a business course in a book, so I think that's a, that's a pretty good recommendation. Um, what made you decide to publish a book? Why was that your sort of, uh, you know, a, a natural step for you, or was it not a natural step? I think it was to try and capture the lessons of life that I had learnt the hard way and to help other people get get there faster and easier. Um, there's a film being made later this year, and that's again the same thing. Can one capture um, what an entrepreneur in the 60s, 70s, 80s, what, we, what it was like, what the society was like, what business was like, what the opportunities were like. Can one capture that in a film? And so I'm really, in a, teaching mode. Um, I hope that you will learn something from the book and I hope that people will learn or feel something from the film. How does it feel, the idea of having yourself played on film? That seems like such a weird concept. Well, it depends what she's like, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I have the right, to, I don't know if you know anything about filming, I'm just learning. Um, I have the right to veto um, both directors and the main characters. 
And we have already two directors, uh, one who comes from the BBC, and Damien Jones, I forget where, where it comes from. You know, what do I know about how to direct a film? Am I really going to sort of say I don't like this now? Um, so, you know, it, it's a nominal feature. So do you, do you if, uh, if, if they put forward an actor to play your role, are you able to veto them? Yes, yeah. Um, I mean, I really sort of say, it, it, it's, the, it's the ideas that are important. And I've sort of said, you know, if you want to give me a female child for whatever reason, that doesn't worry me at all. You can call him, it, him or her exactly what you want. Um, but I see no reason why they shouldn't stick to the reality. Mm -hmm. I think that's such a strange concept. I can't imagine seeing someone <laughs> saying my words uh, on screen. I think that must be so strange. Um, Two more questions. Uh, the first is of uh, of all the accomplishments um, you've you've achieved, of all the things you've done. What are you most proud of, or what are the, the few things that you feel most proud of? I always thought the company was my legacy. It's a very special company. It started from nothing. It finished up as a corporate, eight and a half thousand people. It's you know big stuff working internationally. Um, half the staff in India, which is interesting. Um, but then I moved into philanthropy, and one of the charities that I've set up is a school for autistic children, and that now has 20 million turnover uh, because these are very, very vulnerable pupils, one to one, two to one, three to one, and I mean three staff to one pupil. Um, and so the school has 600 staff, plus a couple of teaching robots, just to sort of liven things up. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, and um, so I, I then decided that the school was there. But really, I think it's what I've done for women. Uh, I think that's what I will be remembered for. That's wonderful. And uh, being a leader is incredibly challenging. Many of the people uh, in this room uh, are leaders and maybe for the first time, um, leading a company. Uh, what would you say are the most important things that you've learnt uh, that you need to be a leader or you need to keep in mind as a leader? Well, leadership is all about integrity, but I mean, I won't go that, that but you know, there is more to leading people. Um, I think most of us have worries about when we find ourselves from technocrat to um, management, to leadership, what am I supposed to do? What are the techniques? And there are things that you can learn. Um, there are courses you can go to. Um, there are people that will mentor you and, and, and help you in that way. But the basic thing about leadership, um, apart from the integrity, is to not underestimate how much you are able to do, how much you are able to. It's your company, you can do it. Um, and Concentrate on things that you know and care about. I mean, if you care about sport, then go into sports technology. If you care about raspberry jam, then study the food industry. Um, so you find something that you really like, um, perhaps just a little bit scared of, because that gives a sort of frisson of pressure and excitement. <laughs> um, get yourself trained and go for it. Well, I think that's um, that's an excellent point to leave things on before we uh, throw it open to questions. Could we just please give this incredible person a round of applause? <laughs> Great. So uh, we have um, we have some questions coming in from the ether. And we also, I'm sure, have some questions in the room. Uh, now, we've had a slight technical hitch with our microphones, so uh, for questions, I'm gonna have to ask you to just uh, put your hand up and then shout it out, and then I will repeat the question so that everybody hears it uh, and, and we can answer. Um, anybody have any questions? Yes. I... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> now, Sorry. before we do that, do let me, you know, point to you because otherwise we're going to have five five people speaking at once. <coughs> yes, please. <laughs> my name is Anderson. I care about autism highly because my son is autistic. Mm. Uh, so this is my close friend, Kim Ma. We started a company called GoCarer two years ago, basically helping families with autistic people. 
So one question I want to ask is, how we can make use of technology? My second is a software engineer. How we can make use of technology to help them excel in the future? That's, I, I think, is the question every parent wants to know about. So the question is about, uh, particularly around autism, how can we use technology to help people with autism spectrum disorder uh, excel uh, in the future? I mean, forget about autism for a moment, but I mean, there are all sorts of assistive technology that help people with various vulnerabilities. Uh, in 1982, the year of disabled people, I was talking in Parliament about um, the blind to see, the deaf to hear, because that's what technology gives to you. Um, there are, just as we have a Fitbit, um, you can well have um, a, a device that tells you um, whether um, you're about to react in a fight or flight mode. And one of the things that's peculiar about autism is that when things go wrong, they go dramatically wrong in a way that it doesn't with people who are non-autistic. Um, so assistive technology is there. Uh, there are books and lectures about it, but it has a big opening. In one of my charities, we're using fingerprint technology to uh, gain access to residents' rooms because that can't get lost. And, you know, um, there are all sorts of things. The, the robot I'm very proud of, but it's doing the very basic things, but it never gets tired of these difficult facts with children. That's, uh, I, I, it, that's a, a stupendous way to use technology in a very real, right there in, in the room uh, environment. Uh, so I'm going to, uh, a question uh, that we have from Katrin Atkins, who is, uh, I think, in Swansea. Um, any advice for women starting out in tech in 2019? Quite a different environment. I think artificial intelligence is the one that's really going to make a lot of difference. We're all slightly scared about it, which is why I sort of say choose something which has that frisson of, 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 of fear in it. Um, the enormous openings. Um, it's not of itself particularly expensive. I don't know whether that's relevant to you. Um, but if you can get into that area, um, working perhaps with others, um, I'm a great believer in partnerships. When you're a small company, you don't have to take over or be taken over. You can work in partnerships with others. And there's some really wonderful opportunities there. I think that leads really nicely on to uh, another question um, we're, we're having through from Swansea from uh, Ollie from Monicado. What advice do you have for men in the tech industry to be more welcoming and inclusive uh, to women in their teens? Well, a lot of the things we talk about, about women in the workplace, um, focuses on the women. Um, and that will always be the case. But I think we're moving to a stage now where men realize that they, they also need access to the skills of a diverse workplace, workforce. And having... Um, The, the need to have that mix means that the men do have to listen and perhaps the need to be um, some in-house codes of conduct so that, um, for example, when I came across sexism, I, <clears throat> I always cleared my throat. And eventually everybody does, oh, she's going to go off about this and so on. And they realise that they've said something really um, unsexist or something. I can remember picking up somebody saying, somebody's Welsh on somebody. And I said, you cannot say that. Um, so within each company, you can sort of say, look, I'm, I'm going to say something. And um, you do it a few times, nicely, charmingly. Uh, that's it. Great. Uh, question at the front here. Um, thank you so much, um, and Shirley. That was very inspirational. My name is Nadia Sud. I run a financial technology company, and 
what struck me about your talk was the focus on culture and building a culture inside of your organization. My company is split between India and the UK. Mm -hmm. So I was curious, as you grew to 4,000 people in India and 4,000 people in the UK or elsewhere, how did you create a bridge for people to have that constructive disagreement? How did you build your culture across those two geographies? So the question there is about how do you uh, build and maintain a culture uh, when you've got international teams? Because obviously that, that connection, those disagreements, those conversations are so important. Well, we, use, we have face-to-face -face meetings as much as we can afford, uh, regularly, regularly. Um, we also use Skype or its, its predecessor a lot so we could see people. Um, in the main, um, we had originally gone to India in 19... I was writing reports about going, exporting software to India um, in 1978. And then it would have, the Indian workforce would have been um, cheap. And so we went there to get the cheap workers. Um, by the time it actually happened, it was 20 years, and by 1998, when we actually started with India, it was a, a, a very skilled workforce um, in short supply. So the relationship changed and became much healthier. Um, we did um, exchange managers, we did have um, a lot of expense in doing that, um, but we were always trusted people to do their best in their own environment. And so once the, the targets were set and the, the um, projects were defined, people just got on with it. We had a question. So the question is around uh, you know, why is it that men have traditionally gone into uh, programming and, uh, and sort of logic based um, industries and, and professions and uh, women have traditionally gone into more creative directions. Why is that and, and do you think that there's a way to, to encourage more women to feel the joy, I think, of those, uh, that, that kind of programming Sort of well, Elizabeth, it, I mean, it is traditional, um, but it's also a stereotype. Uh, when you are working with young children, um, you don't see that at all, and the division comes much later, uh, probably in their teens. And girls of seven, eight, nine find <coughs> the technology really exciting, as everybody else does. Um, some like it better than others, but uh, you know, it's great. By the time they, the same girls are 15, 16, 17, they find it nerdy, they find it boring, they have somehow switched off, and they are lost to the sector. All that innovation, all that energy, all that drive, 50% of the population are pulling back. What can one do about it? It obviously starts pretty early. Um, one could make sure that computer games are less masculine, uh, that they are less rockets going to the moon and people killing each other. Um, because uh, children learn from those games. They're, you know, they're, qu they're quite serious. Um, if there were an easy answer, um, I'd be a billionaire, not a millionaire. Um, and um, I think it behoves each of us to make sure that we are helping young people to avoid those stereotypes. Because there's nothing in your brain that says it's going to go that way. Absolutely, it's, it's something that I'm asked about yeah. a lot. Uh, I think as, as soon as you are a woman in tech, everyone wants to know what you think about women in tech. And for me, it's really about um, diversity more generally. It's not just about gender, it's about every kind of diversity. And it's about letting people do the things 
that they're interested in yeah. without judgment because it's judgment that makes us choose yeah, choose good. different mm -hmm. choose different things you know it's it's eight years old that um that girls think that only doctors are men oh, i can't be a doctor uh, because i'm not a boy and so we have to make changes right at the very earliest stages where it's books it's clothes it's games it's stories it's toys and say they're for anybody who's uh, who's interested in them and, and, and it doesn't matter uh, which which things you're interested in. More questions? Right up the back there. Hi, Pat. Is there any experience that's not in the book that you can say it was a failure for you in your business experience and what you learned from it? So the question is, anything that's not in the book, so I think we're looking for, for, for sneak previews here, <laughs> um, that, uh, that, that was a failure uh, and, and that you learned from the experience? I really have tried to speak very honestly in the book and talk openly about my mistakes. It is what's called a memoir, not an autobiography, by which I mean that the focus is on how I felt about things, how I remember things, so that some bits are just not talked about at all. Now, subconsciously, have I avoided talking about the things that were painful? I don't think so. See what you think? But most people comment that it is very direct. Um, you can hear my voice speaking, and it is warts and all. We are carrying a few warts. <laughs> I, I, I don't know about you, but I find that, that any time I hear a story or watch a movie or something, it's it's the things that people got wrong that, <laughs> yeah. that you learn the most from. You want to hear about yeah. those horrendous, embarrassing experiences because it's so real, I think. Um, we, we've had a question um, uh, from Swansea about fundraising. Did you go through fundraising uh, yourself in your company? In my generation, no woman would ever, ever get funding from me. I didn't even try. <laughs> <laughs> and when other people joined your company, was there fundraising processes while you were still with the company? No. Well, there's a question about your advice. <laughs> 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 an expert. For, for particularly women raising funds, but I think for, for anyone uh, raising funds, but I'm not sure if that's something that you... It's not something that I really... Yeah. Yeah. How, how, do you, um, how do you fund your charity? Is that entirely self-funded, or do you bring others on board to, uh, to help further the work that you do? I've made a lot of money, so... <laughs> 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 I fund it myself. <laughs> Brilliant. You, uh, and, and on that, you also made your team very wealthy at one point. Yes, one of the things I did in the company was to go for co-ownership. It seemed to me only fair that the skills of the staff were what, create, were what was creating the wealth, and therefore they should share in its successes as well as carry some of the risks. So eventually we got a quarter of the company into the hands of the staff at no cost to anyone but me. Um, it peaked at something like 45, I can't remember the names, but around about 45. We had odd things like double voting rights for um, current workforce. So at one time the staff had 62% um, control, though not the ownership. Um, so I was very keen on this sharing to have an egalitarian, um, it's not just me, it's a, um, and because of that, and because the company was successful, um, 70 of the staff became millionaires in their own right. Pretty exciting. I mean, everyone here will will be thinking about um, shares. Seventy one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thinks about and allocates shares to their team, and that you know, it's something that that's really common now in uh, in technology startups. Um, that that I think that the, the yeah. startup technology industry has really helped to further that idea of, of giving some equity to your team. There was a question earlier about getting board members. My first chairman. Um, I couldn't afford to engage him, and it wasn't somebody that I knew personally who would do it as a favor. And, um, and so I paid him in shares. Um, and a few years later, he, he, he got a good payoff. Um, my first company secretary, again, paid in shares. Um, so I really believe in that sharing um, of a larger cake, rather than saying, this is my company, I'm, I'm the only one. Another question, yeah. 
So I was wondering, if you had to start again today, what do you think is the main challenge? So the question is, if Dame Stephanie had to start again today, which, which is, yeah, if, you, if you started today, what would be the main challenges that you think you would have? Apart from doing it all over again. I think the politics don't help you at the moment. <coughs> um, recruiting staff from Europe, um, and that's another form of diversity, is getting more and more difficult. Um, I think I'd bring in financial skills much, much earlier, because I was new, very free. I wasn't interested in the money. I was interested in this crusade for women, and so it was a very different sort of company. I think to think long term, things are moving much, much faster now. I mean, there's never been such a rate of change that we have at the moment. It is amazing, very exciting. And remember, it will never be as slow again if it goes up. And um, I'm glad I made it I don't have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Great, yeah. Hi, thanks very much for a great talk. Um, a number of domains I've worked and played in um, when uh, have shown a lack of diversity. And when you point that out to the people doing the recruiting or hiring, they often say, well, it's a pipeline problem, mm -hmm. which has often struck me as a bit of a, a cop out. And I wonder how you feel about that. The question uh, is, is about uh, diversity in terms of hiring. And that many people say, ah, well, it's a pipeline problem, as in you just don't have enough applications, you don't have enough people seeing your advert, and, uh, and whether Dame Stephanie has any thoughts on that. Well, I think if you're after meritocracy, and I think everyone in this room, that's what we would really want. We want to be viewed for our own merit, not for the colour of our skin or the colour of our hair. Um, <coughs> Got what I was going to say now. <laughs> That's all right. It'll we'll come back to you. Pipeline problem. Yes. Um, the, the main thing for diversity is to anonymize applications so that you are judging people, whether they be autistic, male, female, Siamese twins, or whatever it is, by their capabilities and what they have done in the past. Um, Managers need to be also measured um, with the against the sort of diversity targets. And your diversity target, if you're working in London, would be quite different to if you're working in Leicester. Uh, but nevertheless, there should be targets. Um, and I find that the sheer excitement once you get a mixed um, community. Um, Everybody finds it a, a, a great deal of fun. It's the fear of that diversity. They're not all like me. They're not all women. You know. I mean, I started off with all women. Well, that's not very diverse, is it? <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I think the, an interesting issue around that for the technology industry, and particularly for startups, is we often hire through the network effect. Yeah. We, we want to hire people who have the same sort of attitudes as us and we want to hire people that we know or are friends of friends or, or things like that. And so while it feels like you get a great fit for your company, you are far more likely to be hiring people who are like you. And as we know, the demographic of the technology industry is, is, is white, is middle class, is male. And so we'll just have, have more and more of those sorts of people. I think the, um, the point you make about uh, anonymizing is really important. Uh, this was a massive problem in, um, in orchestras, in, in, yes. in classical music. And so what they did for auditions was they put a screen up. And so all the, uh, the auditioners could hear was the music. And that was it. And but suddenly you've got women in I think it went up by 30% instantly. Yeah. And so I think that, you know, that tells a very important story. Yeah. Um, after my startup failed, I presented to Enterprise. And they are fine because we have a diverse pipeline. We have people coming in. The story we hear is having brought in the diversity, we're not interested in hearing diverse voices. Mm -hmm. We're expecting people to continue repeating the majority voices. So we've got 
in effect, the screen from people with getting female musicians that we're not expecting them to um, complain about anything that's wrong. Mm. We're still playing the same old tunes in the same old way. Very, very interesting point there um, about uh, someone who's who started failed. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Solidarity um, <laughs> has, gone, has gone back into into enterprise, um, and the pipeline problem is not the issue. It's that the hiring from that is the problem because uh, we keep expecting people to be using the same voices to be saying the same things. And if you have a dissenting voice or a dissenting opinion or a dissenting perspective, then you're not hired. Isn't this what Sorry. happens, Elizabeth, with artificial intelligence? That mm -hmm. you, you, it just brings out more people that we already have. Well, it's, it's why we have to have more diverse people creating those programs, creating yeah. those products, because otherwise you get unintended bias, mm -hmm. uh, unconscious bias that gets baked into the systems, and then you, uh, you, you end up with, uh, with, with exactly the same problem. Sorry. Yes, it goes up the back. Um, yeah, I'm the founder of a community organisation for Black, Asian and Minority Ethnic Women that work in fair. I do find a lot of the time people do want advice and do want to learn more about you know, the BAME experience, but they always ask me for free. And I've been um, um, asked to join quite a few boards as a director as well, but always said for free. So I guess if you have a community organisation, how can you make money from it? Really, really interesting point. Uh, this person is uh, involved in a black and minority ethnic community uh, to support people in technology, but is often asked to help for free, uh, which is obviously a big problem. Asked to be boards on boards for free, asked to uh, to to advise for free. That's life. How how can you monetize something like that? That's really a good question. You're building up a network for the future, and that is how it is. Um, we all do a lot of work for free and the payoff is slow but there is one or you, it makes you feel good you know you've just got to do it i think uh, that it's really important for those of us who do have certain privileges yeah. you know I, I i have privilege because i'm a white person to recognize that, that that's the case and if i am asking someone who's a who's a person of color or, or, or from a minority minority ethnicity to help me with something i should be expecting to pay for that because uh, you know I'm, I'm asking for help from someone who doesn't enjoy the same sorts of privileges as I do you know I think I think that's for us to be to be conscious of and to be making making changes to I'm sorry I actually asked a question on the screen as well uh, so if you can leave that one no, that's but fine. Um, it's just the question is um, historically as of all the hiring decisions that you made the best ones do you think they have any consistent qualities Oh, good question. Out of the people that you, uh, that, that was on my list for to ask, thank you. Um, out of all the hiring decisions you've made, what were the things that you, that you noticed that, that, that made those the right decisions, that made those the right people? Is that, is that what you were asking? Yeah. 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 The hiring decisions that made the most difference to me was becoming professional about it. Using professionals to help me. I used headhunters. Yes, it's expensive. Um, but um, it really makes a difference because the cost of a poor appointment that doesn't work is very expensive. Mm -hmm. Nervous energy um, as, well as, fi as well as finance. So I would always say see if you can get some professional help to get, get you through that stage. Um, psychometric testing I have used in the past, um, but only not to select but to help manage new staff whom I really didn't know. Um, and if any of you have used it, it comes up with <coughs> very clear guidelines. This person needs to work in a quiet environment. This person um, needs to work on short projects. This person needs a long learning time, but will get there. So you get those sorts of advice, but once the selection is made, before the selection, I also think you go gut feel. Yeah, that's, that's certainly <laughs> something that I've learned. If 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 I'm not quite there, uh, you it, know, it, it almost always turns out uh, to not be right. But then I'm also concerned about that network effect. Am I expecting someone to be more like me? And so, 
that's where my gut feel is coming from. The other thing that I've found, which is sort of the flip side about those hiring decisions is I've really learned to, to fire fast. You know, if someone's not working out because of, as you say, that, that nervous energy, the management time, it's, I think we end up thinking it's just the cost of that person's salary that we're spending. It's enormous drain. If, if they're not right, but it's the morale of the rest of your team, it's your energy, it's your time, and it's, I had a, a, a great conversation once with uh, Pete Smith, who is the COO uh, of Songkick, and we, we talked about this issue, and I said, it's a long time ago, and said, oh, I have someone and they're sort of there, they're at this kind of level, but they're not sort of really here. And he said, if someone's at 70%, it sort of feels like, oh, that's okay. Yeah. You know, they're sort of doing the job. And he said, but that's actually not the role. Mm -hmm. Your vision for the role is 100%. So they're actually not doing the role. And you shouldn't feel bad about the fact that they're just not right. It doesn't mean they're a bad person. They're just not right. Really, really useful advice. I think we've got time for another couple of questions, Chris. Yeah, we mentioned like the, the low points of your career earlier. So I was just wondering if you were directing a film of your life, what would be the, your favourite scene and why? Ooh, oh, that's such a good question. <laughs> I'm going to repeat this partly to give you some time to think about it, although I'm not sure if you need it. Um, the question was if you were directing the film of your life, which would be your favourite scene? When you read this wonderful book that you've been reading, <laughs> you will, I think, find a picture in there of a group of predominantly women waving share certificates. And the day that the company actually went to share to co-ownership was the most exciting day that I will ever, ever forget. That's quite a, an inspiring thing to learn from. When we go through our EMI processes, do we have a little party where everybody stands there and you know shakes their share certificates? I don't think so. That's actually a really nice way of sort of honouring that that shared commitment to to the vision of the company. I think that's lovely. Uh, any other questions? I think we had one. Yes. Um, I've sat in and often led many board meetings and management meetings over the years. There's one point that got made over and over again, which always drove me absolutely up the wall, which is when it was talking about business development, winning more business, somebody would always say, what we need is a young guy who's hungry is going to go out there and win business. And it just drove me up the wall because of all the assumptions behind that statement, which the person who was saying it didn't realise they were making. I wondered if you had a similar phrase that triggered your fury in these kind of meetings, which came up again and again and again. I feel like, I feel like certainly some people here heard that one, but it was, it was this, uh, this idea that when sales are needed in the company, that someone says, what we need is a young guy hungry to go out and sell all our stuff. <laughs> um, and the, the, that infuriates you because of all the all the prejudices all the things that are inherent in that statement and uh, and asking Dame Stephanie was there something that that triggered you like that not in in that sense I do really believe in um, partnerships in building up relationships um, so in a situation like um, a sales dip uh, the discussion, I, I would try and lead it towards what is the relationship with this person, how can, uh, with this client, how, how can we improve it, what are the things that have gone wrong. Um, and I was asked earlier today what really scares me, and I used to get very, very scared when I had an unhappy client and had to go and face them. Um, and what, what can the unhappy, what's the worst that can happen? That was, I often use, what's the worst that can happen? <laughs> Um, he Did you ever rude. find out? Well, he can be rude to me, but he's not going to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> we hope. I um, <laughs> sometimes I wonder you know, what, what what actually is the worst that could happen. And I think we we all get afraid of being shouted at. Confrontation is really difficult, uh, particularly for British people. I think you know it's not it's not part of the. The, the national culture, and, and I think that's a, a huge difficulty. Did you ever find that challenging? Did you shy away from confrontation? Oh, yes. <laughs> um, I like people, um, so I'm, when I'm disappointed in performance, I find it very difficult to change from um, the rather maternalistic leadership style that I have 
um, to a Messiah. Um, I, looking back, I think I often did what was actually called a constructive dismissal. I would talk and talk and talk and talk until they resigned. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's an interesting technique. Um, I'm going to, to leave it there for questions because uh, then Stephanie is generously offering us more of her time with the, uh, with, with the book <laughs> signings. Um, I, I would like to uh, give a couple of thank yous. Um, first, uh, and again, I would love to thank Hyatt and Silicon Valley Bank. Thank you so much for making this evening possible and for making it possible for us to give everybody uh, a copy of this wonderful book. Uh, I'd like to say a huge thank you uh, to the Tech Hub team who reorganized this space and have been planning this event for ages and uh, they've done an incredible job and I'm incredibly lucky to have such fantastic people working with me every day. It's, uh, it's fantastic. Um, I'd like to thank you all very much uh, for being here and for having such interesting and insightful questions and I would love for you to join me in thanking Dame Stephanie for being so open and sharing so much of herself. Thank you so much. drinks we have time and space obviously for you to chat to each other i would love it if you would make a a very organized line uh, <laughs> over over by the books uh which is just a